everyone. Bill Isle Williams, the Dean of the Sam Walton College of Business, and it's a pleasure to welcome you here this afternoon. We are delighted to have this sixth annual Business Giants Forum, and it's designed just for students, for students to have an opportunity to interact and ask questions directly of these very distinguished business leaders. This is something we feel is a unique kind of opportunity for our students to be able to do, so, to do this kind of uh, exercise and have this kind of experience. And uh, this is something we're pleased to be able to offer here in the Walton College and especially delighted to have such distinguished leaders who would come and give almost their entire day uh, to make this kind of session possible. So we deeply appreciate that. Let me uh, introduce them, if we might. Uh, the first uh, here on my immediate uh, left is Mr. Uh, Edward, or we call him Ed. Is that okay, Ed? Okay. Uh, Drilling, who is president of SVC Arkansas. He joined the company in 1979, where he spent 15 years in various operations positions, including customer services uh, and marketing, and 10 years in external affairs for the organization. He was vice president of external affairs in Arkansas before being promoted to president of SVC Arkansas. Some of you might be aware that for the fifth consecutive year and eighth time in the past nine years, Fortune Magazine has selected SVC Communications, which is the parent of SVC Arkansas, as America's most admired telecommunications company. A native of Marlton, Arkansas, Mr. Drilling received a bachelor's degree in marketing in 1978 from the Walton College, and he's also a graduate of Emory University's Advanced Management Program. His support at the University of Arkansas includes serving on the Walton College's Dean's Executive Advisory Board and the University of Arkansas's 2010 Commission, a very important endeavor for the future of the university. So welcome, Mr. Drilling. Thank you. Secondly, uh, go ahead and give them a round of applause. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Our next business giant that we're most fortunate to have on campus today, Mr. Walter E. Hussman, Jr., the publisher of the Arkansas Democrat Gazette, the state's largest newspaper with a circulation of over 300,000. He is president and chief executive officer of Waco Media, Inc., which also owns the daily newspapers of, let me see if any of you have read these papers. First, the Camden News. Anybody here read the Camden News? Got some folks from down that way. Great. How about the El Dorado uh, News Times? Okay. Got some folks here. Uh, how about the uh, Hot Springs Sentinel Record? Hot Springs here? Right here. Over here. Okay, great. The Magnolia Banner News. Okay. <laughs> I think you read all these papers. Are you uh, been a roving uh, transient over the years, right? From town to town? Golden Triangle. Golden Triangle. Okay. Very good. Uh, the Texarkana Gazette. Okay. <laughs> Did that as well? Okay. And surely then you must have read then the Smackover Journal, right? I don't think you've read the Smackover <laughs> Journal. Okay. Well, he's. That's some of the companies that uh, Waco Media and, uh, owns and operates. Uh, but Mr. Hussman is also the publisher of the Chattanooga, Tennessee, of course, uh, Times and Free Press, which was named in 2003 by a national trade publication as one of 10 American newspapers that are doing it, quote, it right. The company has interest in 17 cable systems serving Arkansas, Mississippi, Oklahoma, and Texas. A native of Camden, Mr. Husband holds a Bachelor's of Arts degree in journalism from the University of North Carolina and an MBA from Columbia University. His grandfather, Clyde Palmer, was publisher of the Texarkana Gazette from 1909 until 1957. And his father, Walter Husband, was publisher of the Camden News from 1949 in 1981. Mr. Hussman began his career as a reporter for Forbes magazine in New York and served as general manager of the Camden News from 1971 to 1973 before becoming executive vice president of Waco. 
A round of applause for Mr. Huston, please. And now on my far left is Mr. Kurt Thompson, although I don't characterize him generally as being on the far left, but you are today, <laughs> Kurt. He is President and Chief Executive <laughs> Officer of J.B. Hunt Transport Services, Inc. Mr. Thompson joined J.B. Hunt, you'll find this, I think, of interest, at the age of 19 while attending the University of Arkansas. So you can see what can happen to you when you start work at a young <coughs> age and you're going to the University of Arkansas. Uh, throughout his early career, he worked in various departments and, and learned uh, all aspects of the transportation business, uh, literally from the ground up. In 1979, he was named Vice President of Finance and Chief Financial Officer of what was then a fledgling $20 million trucking company. He was elected President and Chief Operating Officer in January of, uh, of 1986, and the following year, he was elected Chief Executive Officer. He has served on the board of directors of J.B. Hunt since 1985. A native of Little Rock, Arkansas, Mr. Thompson holds a bachelor's degree in accounting from the Walton College of Business. He's a member of the Walton College of Steams Executive Advisory Board, the University of Arkansas's 2010 Commission, and the University of Arkansas Campaign for the 21st Century, and specifically serving as a member of the College of Education and Health Professions Committee. Welcome. Glad to have you here, Kurt. Round of applause for Mr. Thompson. <laughs> now, at the conclusion of the question and answer session this afternoon, we will have a drawing for our student prizes. So students, you're eligible, but you must be present to win. Now, we will conclude no later than 3 o'clock, so we guarantee you so you can make your next class. Okay, so the... Uh, Watching uh, for the, uh, keep your ticket handy for the drawing afterwards. Okay, let's start with the first question. Who would like to, yes, okay. <coughs> okay, who would like to start that? Uh, Kurt, would you like to <coughs> tell us about one of the hardest decisions you've had to make as in your business career? Um, one of the hardest. That's a hard question. <laughs> <laughs> I guess one of the hardest was a um, few years ago when we were having trouble finding enough truck drivers and decided to raise our driver pay about 33%, uh, which was a big, big decision to make, and it was pretty risky because um, obviously it was going to increase our cost dramatically. Uh, but by doing so, we thought we would be able to, having studied the issue and analyzed it and uh, tried to figure out what the ramifications of that weighty decision would be, uh, we tried to figure out what we thought the outcome would be. And we were right on most, in most cases, but it was a, it was a big step at the time, a, a very big step to uh, step out ahead of the industry and, and take a significant pay increase for our largest group of employees for our truck drivers. Uh, turned out good, though, so that was a good one. Okay, great. Mr. Husband? I, I would say one of the hardest decisions we ever had, I ever had to make was in uh, 1978. Um, we had owned the Arkansas Democrat for four years, and we had been spectacularly unsuccessful. We had lost market share. We had lost money, and uh, we considered closing the newspaper. And... Um, so the decision was whether to close the newspaper or whether to try to come up with a totally different strategy that might work. And we knew if we did that, it was going to take a, a tremendous amount of money to do that and a lot of capital for a small company our size at the time. And uh, so I think that's the hardest decision we ever had to make. And I'm glad we're fortunate. I think we did make the right decision. Okay. Mr. Drilling? Um, well, you know, personally, I think any time you make decisions, um, you're going to have to excuse my voice. My allergies have come early this year along with the leave. But I think any time you make decisions for business, the hardest ones always are the people decisions. And sometimes in our business over the last few years where we've had such tremendous cost-cutting efforts, we've had to, we've been reducing the number of people that we've got. So <clears throat> anytime you're 
work on those kinds of issues and having to make choices and having to work on downsizing the number of employees that you've got is personally really very difficult to do, especially in some cases where you've worked with them for 20 or 25 years. So that, that's one of the most difficult on a personal level. Uh, from, from an overall business standpoint, though, so much of our um, policy in the last few years has been dictated by regulation. So a lot, of the, a lot of the difficult decisions that we've had to make have to do with trying to figure out what road to take in a very complex regulatory environment. Um, and we've had to do that on a state level as well. So a lot of times in our business, in our industry, uh, financial decisions that you make um, based on the regulatory environment mean much more to you financially in the short run than what you might do uh, just in, in some other day-to-day -day types of decisions. So there are any number of regulatory decisions, I think, that, and paths that we've had to take that I think would be, at least in the, in the last few years, the most difficult. Yes. Well, uh, we probably need those asking questions to stand, if I recall, so that the mics will pick this up for us. Okay. So you could have a, a bright career here without going overseas yourself. <laughs> that's, that's the question. Okay. That would put them a step ahead that they could, uh, as students, be prepared. Who wants to start? Sir? Let's try it. Well, I think the uh, <coughs> first answer that comes to my mind is be better than everybody else. Uh, one of my favorite, uh, Ed mentioned how important people are, one of my favorite Yogi Berra axioms, and he's not very good at, with English. But he's real good with philosophy. And he says, if you ain't got no animals, you ain't hardly got no circus. <coughs> and that applies particularly in the transportation business, uh, but I think across businesses, you have to have good people. And really, I mean, that, that, that's what makes the difference in any kind of an organization. You know, you can have the best game plan in the world, but if you don't have the talent, you're probably not going to score. Um, and so learning your trade, whatever that might be, and applying it to where you can uh, be an extension of the enterprise and can add value to the enterprise. You know, I think sometimes people think that you're studying something and you're going to graduate and you're going to go do whatever it is you've majored in, and, and that is the end in itself. That's really not the end in itself because you've got to be able to contribute toward the profit goal unless you're going to work for a nonprofit organization. But I think people in this college tend to uh, work for for-profit organizations. And so to the extent that you're adding value to the organization that you're with, you don't have to worry about them outsourcing your job. Uh, and it tends to be those kinds of repetitive type of, I guess you could say, boring jobs that tend to get outsourced first because they're easier to, to educate somebody and explain to somebody that's not that you're not sitting there staring at. So if it's an offshore kind of thing in India or Ireland or wherever you might choose to uh, outsource. It tends to be the mundane thing. So, you know, stay at the top of your game, and I think you'll be in great shape. I, I think two things. Uh, one is get as good an education as you can, both liberal arts and if you're going to specialize in business or information technology or whatever, because I think that's more important today than it was when I was in college 30 years, 35 years ago. Uh, and. Uh, Number two, when you go out there and look at going to work for somebody, uh, don't grab any comfort out of the fact that you're going to work for a big blue chip company like IBM or someone like that. I think you need to think about, am I going to work for a company that adds a lot of value to their customers? Am I going to work for a company that is 
providing goods and services better, cheaper, and faster than all their competitors. And I'm going to work for a really competitive company, and is that part of the culture of the company I'm going to work for? Because, uh, you know, there's just because it's a big company today and it's been successful in the past, there's no guarantee it'll be successful in the future. Mr. Drilling, do you have some Well, I, I would obviously agree with, with what they're what they're talking about. I think, um, you know, with, with you all coming out with um, college degrees and looking at, at jobs at that level, I think that, you know, certainly looking at the long term and looking at the kind of opportunities that you're talking about are important. But, you know, I, you know we're going to be dealing with this issue for a while. You see outsourcing going on in, uh, you know, in our business where you've got call center jobs moving to India or uh, support jobs, you know, from the tech side going to India, as well as manufacturing jobs, uh, obviously. I think, you know, one thing I would suggest that it's incumbent on all of you uh, as leaders, too, when you get out and you start and you start looking at, at uh, the business climate out there, that we start looking at ways where we can give them businesses incentives to keep those kind of jobs here. Um, you know, we're, we, you all don't remember, and I can barely remember the days when, uh, you know, manufacturing jobs were plentiful and you know, our economy was driven by them and in past you know world wars we relied on that manufacturing drive uh, to, to run our economy and the war machine and the, uh, you know to protect our the life as we know it in this country so I think we're going to have to start looking at ways where we give businesses incentives to keep those jobs here Pro price, pricing and profit margins are driving you know businesses to look for the most inexpensive way uh, you know that they can to do certain tasks we're going to have to find ways, you know, to start looking at keeping those jobs here. Okay. <coughs> Who's next? Yes. Brown's accounting. Yeah. Thompson, so why don't you start with that? <laughs> Countess, don't cheat. <laughs> That's a joke. Y'all are supposed to lie. <laughs> uh, well, because of Sarbanes Oxley, the SEC, if you're a public company, the SEC has um, made the rules pretty tough and, and, and made it to where, um, for one thing, the CEO and the CFO have to sign a letter quarterly that says you're not withholding anything and that the financial statements are accurate to the best of your knowledge and you better have knowledge so you're kind of not off the hook in that case. Uh, but uh, you, you ask the question so that your customers know. I think you probably meant shareholders because uh, the customers knowing are really, in some cases, you don't necessarily want them to know any more than they already do because uh, they might want you to cut your price. That happens occasionally in business. Uh, but in terms of the shareholders, I think they're pretty well protected these days. <clears throat> what will get you in bigger trouble is if your credibility slips uh, based on things you say in between that's not on the printed financial statements or in the 10K or the 10Qs. Uh, when you predict things, that's where you really can get in trouble if you can't deliver those once you have said, well, we think this quarter, you know, we're expecting earnings in a range of X to X. And six weeks later, you have to come out with a pre-announcement and say, we're not going to make those because of this or because of that. Your credibility can really suffer. And once your credibility starts to suffer, it takes a long, long time to get that back in the investment world. So um, I think that's what you have to watch out for. I do think that we tend to swing the pendulum too far the other direction sometimes. You know, a few bad apples like Enron and WorldCom, uh, who were actually were cheating and, and fudging things and cooking the books. Uh, you know, maybe I'm naive like some of the rest of us, but I don't think that happens generally. I think it's, it has been a, a few um, isolated cases, but in, in the last two or three years, of course, those cases have been very visible and high profile type cases. So. What's happened is that the SEC rules have swung entirely too far the other direction. Uh, so it, the rules, you're pretty well protected now if you're an investor, I think, which is, of course, happened. But um, 
And it's added cost, as a matter of fact, to operating in business because Sarbanes Oxley has added millions of dollars into the uh, uh, expenses of public companies. Uh, it's also made a, a revenue stream for uh, accounting firms. If any of you are in accounting, you've probably got a better prospects for a long-term career because of Sarbanes-Oxley. So I don't think that's as big a problem as it's been made out to be. Um, and I think it's there's been some overreaction um, in terms of trying to correct it. Let me ask a, a little follow-up question on that. The, to what extent do you think the financial analysts projections of earnings have been a driver for misbehavior in financial reporting, trying to meet those targets? That's an excellent question. I think expectations, uh, particularly quarterly expectations, have have driven some, well, I think in the case of Enron and WorldCom, those are two good examples where the expectations for the quarter set by analysts uh, have caused people to get out on the edge too much, you know, take too many with, with reality. Okay. Anyone else want to respond we're, to this? We're part? a private company, unlike the two public companies, uh, so issues are probably a little different for us. We don't have quarterly earnings and things. And uh, actually, you know, a lot of, uh, in the case of WorldCom, uh, they were capitalizing a lot of things that should have been expensed. As a private company, we're always expensing as much as we possibly can. <laughs> But it, it has made us, even as a private company, re-examine our policies and, and think uh, more deliberately about what does get expensed, what does get capitalized. And I think the most important thing, really, for you all as uh, students going, getting ready to enter the business world is to try to assess the honor and integrity and honesty of the people you're going to go work for, uh, and especially the people at the top of the organization. Because people of integrity don't do the kind of things that they did at those companies. Students in auditing, you just heard a good tip about the <coughs> approach that you would take to auditing a privately held company versus a publicly held company. So please note that. <laughs> okay, Mr. Drilling? I would just add, you know, obviously with the WorldCom scandal, our industry has been under um, a lot of scrutiny over the last couple of years. A lot of the things that have now been implemented in some companies uh, to try to reassure investors we really had implemented before then. We have a, a very strong independent board, a uh, very strong audit committee that acts independently without any uh, internal executives that are on that committee. Uh, they're very capable people. Um, and so I've, we've always, I think, tried to show a high level of, of um, integrity and, and self-discipline when it, when it comes to, to those, those kinds of issues. But um, you know, it's, it's something that you've really got to continually monitor uh, and, and keep up with. I, I would add, Dean, to your question that we've stopped projecting our quarterly earnings. We announced them, you know, after at the end of the quarter, but we stopped trying to make these projections where you're driven so closely with what, mm -hmm. you know, what hitting that number on the nose or, or exceeding it, because I think it does kind of um, produce bad behavior. Okay. Next question. Yes. Avid reader of all the newspapers in Arkansas. <laughs> <laughs> uh, when you all are looking to hire someone, do you all look at more at attitude and self-presence, or do you all look more at what they have achieved in the past and what they plan to try to do in the field? Okay. Is that a reflection of your grade point, or are you? <laughs> 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 He's a good Walker reader. and I were talking about that earlier, and I said, someone will ask that question. <laughs> That's right. uh, and we can both give you hope. Uh, because I think, uh, you know, while a, a good grade point average does tend to indicate that you're serious, that you take care of business, but uh, if you don't have the right attitude, and sometimes attitude can, and energy and enthusiasm, and, um, you know, I, I would tell each of you, if you're not enjoying what you're doing right now, you probably need to think about doing something else. Because when you get out in the real world, and if business is boring to you, uh, you're in the wrong spot. You need to find something that you that you enjoy because if you enjoy it, you know I know I realize that makes us nerds uh, in some cases, but uh, if you really like that, if you get into that, then you'll do a good job. And you know there's uh, people can tell the difference in people who have enthusiasm and attitude, and and a good attitude is just is worth tons. So. Um, 
you know, if you uh, are interviewing with somebody and the grade point average is not summa cum laude, uh, and you want to make up for it, then you need to be enthusiastic and, and demonstrate a good attitude. Because it's, it's um, you know, if you've got to prop somebody up all the time and get them inspired every day, that's a, that's a hard job. That's a good question, though. Ed, do you want to say something? Sure. I, you know, I would just add to that that um, I think we look at uh, people's resumes. Certainly, grade point is a is a part of that, um, but also other activities that you've been involved in. You know, I mean, what kind of leadership role have you taken in other other parts of either life on campus or activities outside of of uh, school here? Um, you know, have you taken a leadership role in some? Um, effort in a nonprofit, or have you? You know, what what else have you excelled in besides grade point to show some leadership capability and the ability to work as a team member, as a team leader? Um, because I think that those are the kind of things that help you uh, really get ahead. You know, besides being smart, and you can be the smartest person in the world, but when you get into a company, especially like ours, it's that's you know we've got ninety, a hundred and. 80,000 employees now, and you're finding your way through all that, um, you've got to be the kind of person that's smart, but you've also got to be the kind of person that others want to see succeed, um, whether it's your peers that you may be competing with, people that are working for you that want to see you succeed, or especially the people that you're working for. So I think those kind of qualities that you bring forward through other activities that you've been involved in besides just your grade point are important. To answer that by telling you an anecdote that I think should be very inspiring to all of you. When I graduated from college, I had a friend who was a year ahead of me, and uh, he didn't go on and get a graduate degree. He went to New York and got a job in a training department at a bank. And so uh, he'd been there about a year, and they gave him one of the worst jobs in the bank. And, and what that job was was to go make cold calls in Arkansas, Louisiana, and Mississippi to try to make loans. He was working for a bank called Chemical Bank. And so when he came to Arkansas, he thought, gosh, you know, I don't know anybody in Arkansas except that one guy, Walter Huston, who lived down in Camden, Arkansas. I'm going to call him Murphy Oil. I think I'll give him a call. So he called me, and uh, we'd have, uh, you know, have dinner about three or four times a year at the Duck Inn in Camden and just kind of shoot the bull. And, you know, he never, he told me, he says, you know, I'm, I'm kind of, you know, I never made a B or an A in college. I always made C's. And. He said, uh, this is kind of a tough job, but I'm kind of enjoying it. I met some folks up at this company called Dillard's and made them alone. And, you know, I got Murphy Oil, they're making a long, well, they're making a long story short. This fellow continued his career, and pretty soon they sent him to the West Coast, and he was in charge of West Coast banking for Chemical Bank. After he'd done that about four or five years, they sent him to London, and he was head of European lending for Chemical Bank. Today, 32 years later, he's chairman and CEO of J.P. Morgan Chase. And all he made was C's in college. But he's obviously a guy that's got a great attitude. And he had a, he, when they gave him that job to do, make cold calls in Arkansas, he didn't have a bad attitude about it. He had a great attitude about it. He's been very successful. Okay, great question. All that from the duck in. Yeah. All right. Great <laughs> responses. Okay, who's, who's next with questions? Someone surely's got questions. Yes. Would you say I'm job people is really limited in the job rights that they got the opportunity to do that within the company setting? Job growth in your company, is it you're going to be expanding your workforce? I think it's a bad time to be looking for a job. <laughs> <laughs> How does that make you feel? Uh, particularly white collar jobs. I'm making you feel better already, I can tell. Uh, because people have their margins have been squeezed to the point where everybody's tried to do this, do more with less. And, um, you know, the good news probably is that the economy seems to be improving a little bit, not just zooming, but it seems to be getting better. And that'll, I think that will spur some growth in, in jobs. But um, I don't see companies rushing out there at this point to hire. Uh, I think they're being very cautious about uh, their hiring plans and, uh, you know, you, it, you'll just have to stick out of the crowd, I think, more in this environment. Yeah. Now, we're, we would hire you if you're a truck driver in a heartbeat. But, uh, 
we don't find many people in this environment that want to be truck drivers. Okay, Jose, go ahead, Walter. Um, we are not seeing a big increase in hiring in our in our companies, but uh, the advertising business has really not rebounded uh, like like uh, other segments of the economy have. Although we have started seeing some pickup in help wanted advertising, but help wanted advertising is down so significantly from what it had been three three or four years ago, it's nowhere near back to, to what it was saying in the year 2000. So uh, seeing a little bit more, but the big problem I think everyone is confronted now entering the job market is productivity. You know, this is the most productive economy the world has ever seen. If you look at manufacturing jobs, we all know manufacturing jobs are being lost in the United States, and you hear about, well, they're going to China. But what you don't hear so much is worldwide manufacturing. All manufacturing in the world, there's fewer people manufacturing worldwide than there was because productivity is increasing so much all over the world. And uh, so it's a, it's, a, it's a difficult challenge, and it's kind of a different challenge than we've seen in previous business cycles, I think. Well, and of course, our industry you know, has been as probably battered as, as any over the last few years in terms of job loss. Um, you know, some estimates, you know, are half a million jobs lost in the tech sector and the telecom sector. Um, part of that is just because of the tech bubble and the issues around all that. But I, you know, in telecom specifically, there there was a lot of purchasing and a lot of growth in the telecom industry in the late 90s. Um, and, and when the economy turned down, I think a lot of what happened in our industry was because so many purchases had been made in the last few years of the 90s that that's the first place that a lot of companies look to cut. So in turn, there's a, that's the first place that a lot of telecom com companies felt the pinch and started cutting back on the number of jobs there. We're, we're hoping this year that we start seeing a little bit of an upturn. Uh, we're optimistic by the end of the year that we'll, we'll start seeing our industry specifically uh, start turning around. Uh, and so in, within that framework, I think there are going to be some opportunities. Certainly the wireless industry continues, uh, you know, good growth, and we think it, it still will. Um, we still see good Internet growth. We still see, um, you know, growth there and, and some jobs. I think that will come out of that. We're, we're still adding salespeople. Um, so even though we're, we're also the beneficiary of some of the, some of the efficiencies that Walter's talking about, um, we still got people that we need on the streets. You know, we need to be out there talking to customers and business with them. So I'm hopeful, you know, that this will be the year that we kind of see a little bit of an upturn and some job growth. Things do tend to cycle, so, you know, maybe it's a good time to extend your college experience and go to graduate <laughs> school. There you go. Okay, who's next? Yes, would you stand, please? Oh, I love that question, <laughs> uh, because you're right on target, I think. Uh, you know, we were talking about this at lunch, in fact. It, it's like a reporter saying something, and then it's fact. Uh, just because somebody's a financial analyst and says that a company should do such and such doesn't necessarily mean that's accurate. So when you, quote, uh, fail to meet expectations, that doesn't necessarily mean it's internal expectations. It's some... some uh, model that a research analyst has concocted. And unfortunately, one of the downsides of, of a rule that the SEC passed a few years ago called full disclosure, you can't help people along as much as you used to could in terms of, of taking a look at their model and saying, well, you're off in this area, you're off in that area. You can't do that anymore because if you do that for one, you have to do it for everybody. So you about have to tell the world everything. So there's been a lot less conversation to and fro with research analysts and companies. And as a result of that, they're out there on their own. So if things change, you know, you can give general direction, but that doesn't necessarily mean they're going to pick it up and put it in their model or that they're going to accurately forecast it. Uh, so a lot of times when, when numbers are off, either positively or negatively, 
It's because the analyst models are wrong, not because the company's doing anything bad or good, necessarily. It's just they missed the, they missed the target. It happens all the time, uh, which is an excellent uh, question. And we also do not give quarterly or annual guidance uh, unless it's just way off the mark. And in some cases, we've said uh, that uh, you really ought to examine the numbers for the first quarter because typically the first quarter is slow or something like that. But in terms of giving guidance, we don't give guidance precisely for that reason. But uh, that's a, a, an excellent question and a real problem. And I would also say on that point that I was making earlier about the pendulum swinging too far in one direction, uh, that the SEC has... has um, uh, insinuated at the very least and, and pretty much said that that research analysts tend to um, favor companies who favor their companies with investment banking business. And that's been true to some degree, but uh, I think you know there really needs to be some sort of governance over research analysts who miss the mark enti entirely. I mean, they can be irresponsible and lead people astray and make insinuations that are just totally wrong and um, there's very little concern about the company. There's more concern about the shareholder, which, you know, there should be concern with shareholders, but an even treatment there I think would, would, would be good. But um, we don't try to meet research analyst estimates. We try to do as good as we can and let the chips fall where they may. But it's difficult as a public company and that hot spotlight being on your quarterly earnings number and if they're outlandish, you about have to say something about it in advance so they don't get carried away, but it's a great question. Either one of you want to add anything to that? No? Okay. Who's next? Someone in the back, back there? No? Just stand up and ask your question. Yes. Yes, sir. affected your business? Hmm. Well, it's given people a lot more to read about, I guess. That's <laughs> how it's affected our business. Uh, we're, uh, I'm afraid it's going to hurt our workman's comp. I'm worried because we're sending a couple of people to Iraq to be embedded with uh, a National Guard unit from Arkansas. Uh, we sent some people to Afghanistan uh, recently. They were over there for five weeks, and I was worried to death the whole time they were over there. Uh, worried about these people going to Iraq also, but... Uh, so we're, we're a little bit unusual being a newspaper, but uh, that's the main impact it's had on us. But with more news coverage, does that lead to more papers, uh, more pages of your paper being published and therefore more advertising? Uh, no, not really. It's just, um, you know, there's uh, the war in Iraq is, is what's news, so there's more of the given space that's given over to Iraq coverage and, as opposed to something else. I think the biggest impact on our business, either directly or indirectly, is the price of, of uh, oil and diesel fuel, uh, which is, if you've all bought gas recently, you know it's way high, and we buy a lot of diesel fuel daily. So that's had a big impact on us, and I guess you could say that's been an, uh, an outcome of the war. And also people that have left and gone <coughs> and called up for various <coughs> services to uh, participate in the war. I would add just on our business, it's mainly just what every general business sees in terms of impact on the economy. Uh, you know, the, con the aspect of the confidence in the economy for people holding back on spending, especially on telecom purchases, uh, for fear of you know, what's going to be the next shoe to drop, or what might happen next. So there's probably an underlying impact there, but, but not really anything just directly to SBC. We have some students who are watching through uh, a webcast, and one question has come in. Do you have any advice for a young person interested in starting his own small business? Why don't you start with that, Mr. Okay. Husband, since you're a private and I, I talked about the growth of... Right. <laughs> I would encourage you to do that. Um, the, uh, you know, if you own your own business, you aren't going to be, you know, outsourced somewhere else. You're going to be in control of your own destiny, and... Really, most of the jobs that are created in America are not created by Fortune 500 companies. They're created by small businesses. And uh, if you start your own small business, you can be flexible. You can, you know, change direction, change strategy, change markets, et cetera. And uh, 
plus it's an extremely rewarding thing to do to, to be an entrepreneur to be a to be in control of your own business it gives you a tremendous self uh, sense of accomplishment when you're successful and uh, it teaches you a great deal of humility which is also a good business uh, experience to have uh, mr thompson you started when jb hunt was a relatively small company uh your thoughts about a person uh starting out and starting their own business i agree totally with with walter i think it's a great opportunity and a good time to do it when you're young you don't have a whole lot to lose but there is risk out there, but it's also a, it's a great learning experience. You know, when you go to work, and we're a fairly large company, so we need we need all kinds of people. But uh, if you go and you you know you're plugged into a particular function, you don't have in many cases the luxury of learning how business actually works. Um, the new core program at, in the, at the business school, I think that's an excellent idea because you really need to know how to make money in a for-profit business. Until you understand that, how do, how do economics play into that? How does finance play into that? Uh, sales, marketing, um, operations, the whole thing, how it fits together and turns a profit is much easier to learn, I think, in a small company because the onus is on you. Monkey's on your back. If you're going to make it work, it's got to work um, through you, so I think that's an excellent way to to, uh, to learn how business works, and there is a lot of reward there. Uh, with risk comes with comes uh, reward if you pick the right thing and do it well, and uh, so I'd encourage people. I think that's a, an excellent way to start a career. Mr. Drilling, would I, you have any comments? Is there entrepreneurial <laughs> kind of opportunities or spirit within uh, SBC? I think you know within our industry there certainly are. I think again. You know, we've seen over the last five years some companies come and go where people have tried you know to get out there and start start their own business and and it's tough but I, I think there there are opportunities there are niches out there that I see every day where there are opportunities of people with a good business case a uh, decent way to capitalize it uh, can get out there and take advantage of it um, my wife is a small business owner so I would have to agree with with Walter it's you know, it can be a really rewarding experience it can also put you under a lot of pressure. You know, you're you're the person on the on the line out there, and uh, it can cause some sleepless nights, um, even for your spouse. So, um, but there are, I think, a lot of opportunities out there right now with a good business case and profit capitalization. I think there's there's some good opportunities. I'd add one other thing: don't do it if you want to work a 40-hour week. <laughs> okay, <coughs> good advice. Who else? Okay, stand up, please. Knowledge of a second language. How important to have it? Well, we, we operate in Mexico, so if you're bilingual in Spanish, that a lot of times there are uh, openings for that. We have several people who are who are Spanish speaking. We do a little bit of business in Montreal, so if you can speak French, we might have one spot available for French speakers. But, um, and I think generally, you know, not just our case, but obviously with the uh, the um, boom in the Hispanic population in the U.S., you can just look around Northwest Arkansas. A second language is definitely a plus, and should be required, by the way. Okay. I, I would just add that we, at, at SBC, we are doing business in 22 different countries. So, um, of course, we have an interest in Telmex, have an interest in a couple of European countries, uh, one of them headquartered in France, um, some interest in Asia. So, you know, obviously that helps if you've got that ability. Um, I think it's, a, it's certainly a plus. And, you know, with growth that we're seeing, as uh, Kirk said here, you know, in another um, eight years, half this half the population um, in the United States is going to be made up of minorities, of some sort of minority. Um, a lot of them are not going to be necessarily Eng English speaking. So I think even if you're looking domestically at opportunities here, it's certainly a plus. I think it's a great plus to know a second language. In our particular company, it wouldn't be advantageous now because we don't have any Spanish language publications, but 
10 years from now, we probably will. Okay, next. Um, I always look at the question. I have mine back there in the back. Okay, please stand and ask. the question. <laughs> uh, that's a real difficult thing uh, to figure out. If it's something that, you know, the first thing you got to ask is, is there a demand for this? Does anybody want what I've got? Uh, is this something that I can sell? And um, if you can, you know, pass that first question and move on to the next. Something that Ed said is particularly important is to be capitalized right on the front end. That's, I think, probably the biggest mistake of small businesses is that they go into it undercapitalized. And uh, you gotta, you got to figure that uh, there are going to be some rough times along the way. People do pro forma financial statements, and they tend to be a little on the optimistic side because you believe in it and you want it to work and you want it to make it happen and so you tend to be on the optimistic side and you really need a worst case scenario and figure out okay if this happens it's not likely to but just in case it does am i going to be able to make it over that hurdle that first barrier to survival and um, but first of all you got to figure out is it something anybody wants uh, that's the hard part i think I think it's always helpful to keep in mind when you think about risk is to segregate the business risk from the financial risk. And the business risk would be how risky is this business of opening a fast food franchise or of being in, you know, the delivery business or whatever, you know, how much volatility is in that business? Is it cyclical or whatever? And, you know, some people might be in a great business, but then the financial risk is they just load up with way too much debt. And then the first business cycle, they get wiped out. So I think it's helpful when you think about risk to think about those two as, as separate separate things. Um, well, you know, I mentioned the, in the, the previous question the, the fact about having a good business case, good business model that you go into it with. And, we, and I keep kind of going back to the tech sector and some of the things that we've kind of learned a lesson from um, over the last few years. There was a time in the late 90s that you could see a lot of comp a lot of companies or small businesses or startups from Silicon Valley or somewhere else that would come in and have a business model, business case, and could get capitalization about the same rate that we could. You know, I mean, the money was just pouring into these in these businesses, and that's of course what you saw. So many of them tank, and uh, so many losses that that have occurred. I think the whole the whole marketplace out there is wised up, there's a lot more scrutiny about it. So I think you've got to have a good business model and a good business case, uh, well thought out, um, so you can get the proper level of capitalization to kind of help you through what is in inevitably going to be some ups and downs in, in the first few years. Um, but, you know, I mean, ultimately, you all, you all are too young to remember Dr. Hay, who used to teach here, but ultimately it all comes down to what he used to say is, profit! <laughs> you know, uh, you're you're going to have to you're going to have to find a way to get something that people want and, uh, and make some money off of it. Uh, I don't know if you've got like a specific example, but we had a situation in our company where I don't think we'd ever borrowed more than $5 million. It's the maximum amount of debt we'd ever had. And in 1991, when the uh, Arkansas Gazette closed, we bought their assets for $68 million and we had to borrow all that money. We didn't have a lot of money sitting around to do that with. So I realized, hey, we've got more financial risk here than we've ever had. And so what are some of the components of financial risk? Well, what if interest rates really spike, you know, and they go way up? We may not be able to pay this debt off. And so what can we do about that? You know, how can we protect ourselves from something we have no control over? And we sat down and talked to our bankers about it. And they said, well, you can go into an, an interest rate swap and you can guarantee yourself a fixed rate out over the next seven years. Uh, you're going to have to pay a higher rate right now than you would if you paid a floating rate. 
when we looked at that and we said, wow, that really reduces the financial risk to us of interest rates really spiking and us getting wiped out. So we did that. So uh, there are things you can do, you know, and that, that's a specific example. I had a question, I think, over here. Yes. Uh, I think on customer service, the first thing that comes to mind with me is the is uh, information technology. And uh, a lot of things in the last, you know, probably 10 years, uh, EDI, for example, uh, you know, used to be you call, we haul in our business. You had to get on the phone and call somebody and look for a truck. And, and now a lot of that's done electronically. And um, so that's a big issue. And then we have uh, satellite communication on all of our trucks, so we know exactly where they are. We can communicate with the driver and he with us. Uh, our trailers all have tracking devices on it, so we know whether or not where they are, first of all, and whether or not they're loaded or empty. You know, that allows us to... Uh, make a lot of decisions that were in that regard. So I would say information technology has had the biggest impact on customer service in, uh, in the last 10 years uh, in our business. I don't think our strategy has changed on customer service. I mean, the, what we do has changed, but not our strategy. And I, I think strategy is that customer services uh, can, really, can really drive your business and, and give more value to your customers if you have better customer service than your competition. And customer service really can be a great uh, advantage for your company if you get in a situation where you really can't compete on, pro on price, but you can compete on service. And again, to give, give you, an, you know, an anecdote on that, um, when we were confronted with, you know, with competing against Gannett when they acquired the Arkansas Gazette, well, we realize we can't compete on price with these guys. They're just too big, and they've got too many financial resources. So how can we compete? We said, well, we can compete on customer service. Well, how can we do that? Well, we said, we're going to put the newspapers on the porch, you know. And they were putting the newspapers in the yard, and they continue to put the newspapers in the yard. And it costs us a fraction uh, of what it costs them by cutting their prices to spend the extra money to put the papers on the porch. And it turned out that the customers really valued getting the paper on the porch a lot more than they valued at several dollars a month off their subscription price. So you can use customer service as a competitive tool, and especially if you find yourself in a situation where you can't compete on price. I tell you, my wife appreciates your paper on her front porch. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not getting mine on the porch, Walter. <laughs> <laughs> well, it'll be there soon. Well, you know, it's funny because when I was a year out of school here, um, one of the first jobs I had at SBC, and I guess that would make me a year or so older than some of you, was managing a customer service group at SBC of what was then Southwestern Bell. And so what I've seen in that time, not only in our strategy, but just in the technology um, that we, deplo we deployed over that time in order to, to keep up with with the business and, and what's happened in the telecommunications industry has just been, you know, revolutionary. It's not been an evolution, it's been a revolution because um, we can now, you know, we have test centers now that are in Kansas City that can test to see what's wrong with your line uh, here in, you know, Fayetteville. Um, of course, the other thing I always hear from people is when, when you're talking about talking to the telephone company is just give me a real person, you know. And I know that that's a frustration because you know, 25 years ago, we had people sitting there waiting to call, waiting for you to call them. We had total accessibility. You didn't have to wait in line or in queue for anything. Of course, the cost that or the expense that we went to to have that kind of accessibility, uh, just we could not maintain it. In a business like ours where pricing pressures are always there, we the strategy change is that we've had to look for ways to provide customer service as good as we can as in responding to customers, but do it in the most efficient way that we can. So it's required us to go to more voice response systems, uh, directing your call to a trained individual that could help you, rather than having a, what we used to call a universal service rep that could literally take any kind of call uh, and, and get your 
problem solved, whatever it was. So we've, we've really had a total uh, system change in the way we interact with our customers. I think the, the next big step that you are going to see is in voice recognition technology, where instead of when you get somebody now, then or you get a voice response system that says, push two if you want this, or push three if you want that, if it's a repair problem, push this. You'll have the, the speech recognition technology is going to be so good that you can literally, I don't care if you speak with an accent or, or, or from New York or wherever, um, you can interact with this machine and get to the right person um, and get taken care of. And we're constantly evaluating that, asking customers what they want and trying to respond as best we can. Well, we're nearing the end of our time. Let's express our appreciation to our panelists. We appreciate so much for being here. Okay, uh, time for the student drawing. Uh, we have uh, three prizes that to be awarded, so we'll let each of our panelists draw a number. And if you've got your ticket there, we'll see what you win. Sure. I get my daughter or something. What's the first prize, Nancy? <coughs> Walton College Windbreaker. And the proud owner of that will be, we probably can just use these last three numbers, can't we? Four, uh, four, four, six. It's four, four, six in the room. You have to be present. Ah, coming down. Okay, come on down. It's an XL. Okay, Nancy, what's second here? Uh, several items, goodies from the University Bookstore. Uh, number 282. Okay, and the last item. $50 gift certificate. $50 off your next set of books over there. Okay, and that, the last three numbers is 447. <laughs> 447. <laughs> Not here. Oh, yes, she is right here. Okay. Uh, congratulations to all of you winners, and thank you for, for participating. Uh, Therese, you have an announcement to you come over and make that quickly? Therese Cypher, Director of our Career Services. Thank you. We would like to announce that following this, we do have General Mills here. They are um, going to give us an uh, exposure day talking about the Company of Champions, General Mills. And all of you are invited if you are a freshman, sophomore, and think semester is long. So we would love to see you next or on seminar X. Okay. Uh, we have some uh, mementos for our uh, speakers here. We'll present those shortly, but uh, you're invited to a reception out in, in the uh, atrium, so come join us and spend a few minutes with our special guest today, and thank you for coming. Appreciate it very much.